Hello everybody and welcome back to Leadership in Blue Jeans, our third episode with me in it, at least as a moderator. Um, we're once again in the Mindspace space building. Uh, thank you very much to Mindspace for lending their space to us for, for this production. Today I have two exciting guests. One is Andre Neago and at the far end Mario Spana. Uh, both of them interesting and uh, inspiring leaders and they have stories to tell which we're going to explore today. Um, so, but I'll let them introduce themselves uh, briefly and uh, why don't we just start with Marius. Great, thank you Frank. So my name is Marius Pana. I am the CEO of Spearhead System. We're an IT service provider and I am now dabbling in some new businesses to help me uh, become a better entrepreneur. <laughs> that, we want to know more about that also. <laughs> we'll get into it, I hope. <laughs> okay. Andre. Hello, uh, I'm Andre Nagu. I'm also an, an entrepreneur. I'm very passionate about, about data and about education. So that's a, it's a very interesting combination. I have a, um, a company who's providing uh, entry-level professionals uh, to uh, different partners. And uh, before that, we have some trainings for uh, two to six months of trainings. Uh, and then afterwards, we provide all of those people to, to our partners. A super exciting concept. I have looked it up and uh, encourage everybody to do this also. Uh, it's, it's very exciting. Um, let's start about leadership. So maybe just start it off. Everybody knows that leadership is something that you never really stop learning about. There's always something about yourself, about the way how we lead people, that we haven't accounted before, so we learned through the situation. So I'm wondering if you could bring to mind a situation, a recent situation, where you say, that's, you know, that's been a situation recently where I've learned something new about leadership. Does anybody, anything come to mind? Of course. So this, uh, um, so you, this interview comes at a crux in my life where I'm sort of consolidating all of the information I've had from running this business and trying other things. So just this week I've had it. What is it? Today is Tuesday, right? Wednesday, Tuesday. I don't even know the day. <laughs> Tuesday. Yeah. So just this week, yesterday, I had the realization that I've been making mistakes in the way I manage things. And, uh, you know, I, I, I appreciated the fact that I've finally had the realization that I was making a mistake so that now I have the opportunity to correct it. And what happens is now I'm thinking, how many other things am I making the same mistake on? And I just haven't come to the realization that I'm making those mistakes so I can actually address them. So to, and my thought is we constantly, or I constantly realize that I need to learn and adapt and relearn certain things. So I am coming to the conclusion that this is going to be an ongoing process probably for the rest of my life. It is, but do you uh, remember a particular example that you could share where you say, oh, I had this particular realization? Uh, um, without getting into too many details because it would probably yeah. fork off into other things, um, it's in my hiring process. So I've been unfortunately quite superficial in the way that I've been hiring people, specifically where I need to be involved and to, to mm -hmm. verify them. So. Um, that's that's the just of it. So I, I've been superficial, not looking close enough, not placing the right questions and overlooking certain things and not listening to my gut. You know, sometimes you're so ready to hire the person that, you know, the, the best sales guy ever or whatever, you're like, this is the guy and you've got chemistry and everything, but you overlook some things that your gut's telling you don't overlook that. Put some pressure on those questions or, you know, look at it from a different perspective. And um, I did not do those and then it, you know, it didn't work out as, as well as I had intended. Yeah, I completely agree. Do you have uh, experience with the same that, uh, you know, you have learned sometime over the course of your career that listening to your gut when it comes to people is just as important maybe as just looking at the data? Hiring people is also one of, uh, one of my main responsibilities. And uh, we, we are the Nexus Learning Laboratory. Um, to be, to be able to guarantee the job at the end of the courses, because that's what we are bringing in, in Romania. We guarantee the job. Of course, we need to, to have from the beginning the right people. And uh, sometimes we, we have uh, a, longer pro a longer hiring process than maybe a company. So uh, we are really, uh, we, we put very, very much effort into that, very much energy. And uh, I'm, I'm 
constantly learning about how to hire the, the best people to, uh, to train and then to, to hire. And that's also one, one thing that I always learn. So we, uh, we have a very specific hiring process. We, uh, the, before a person can, can start with us, you need to have three yeses, like in Romania, you got talent, you know. Mm -hmm. The first yes is, a, is, a, is from the technical perspective uh, and from the um, analytical perspective, because we give him also a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of problems, uh, logical problems. Then the second yes is from, from, the, from the HR perspective and for him as a person to, to be cult culturally compatible with our partner, uh, which we, we want to provide uh, the people to. And then the, uh, the third one is, is from the team because we, we are involving people in the, in, in, the, in the whole business process as they come in, in Nexus, as they come our students. They also get involved in, in the hiring and also in, in other processes and, and, and they help actually the business grow and, uh, and we, we, we try to develop them more than technical skills, also some, some business and hiring skills and why not, you know. Yeah, now that you explain it this way, of course it becomes uh, quite clear that uh, for you this particular process must be something you pay uh, a particular amount of attention to. I wanted to piggyback on something that you said. Um, about uh, diversity, actually. I just recently had a discussion with, uh, with friends about that. Um, and I also read an article about that, that. I think this is where I got the idea from, is that you know, in recent years, uh, there's a lot of discussion about uh, making sure that companies actually encourage uh, diversity in hiring. In diversity in terms of gender, religion, color, you just really don't, um, how do you say, want to hire the, the mini-me's, you know? Uh, with the promised benefit of the fact that, you know, with diverse viewpoints, you actually innovate faster, you create better solutions than if everybody were just looking at a problem from the same direction. At the same time, uh, in practice, managers don't really, really like to hire diverse. So why do you think that is? Hmm. I, I think that uh, yeah, we, we as entrepreneurs, we always think about, about the business, but uh, uh, it's also about the people and creating teams. And uh, also, uh, like Warren Buffett was saying uh, once, you need to, to, to work with those people which you uh, want to, uh, uh, to also party, which you want to be also outside of the business, people you can relate to. So of course, here comes a bit of the of the biases, personal biases, Marius was, was telling about. Um, but um, on the diversity part, uh, I have a particular challenge on that because uh, I, I take I, uh, I take students from from the universities to train, but I also take um, people who want to to change their their career, and uh, to have those mixed teams between fresh graduates and people for maybe. A, a, 40 or 50 years, it's, it's very challenging to put them together and to, uh, to make them a team and to collaborate. So uh, I'm, I'm very, a very fan of, of this kind of um, this kind of diversity from, from actually from this perspective. It's challenging, but uh, everyone has, uh, has, to, has, has something to win from that. Well, what makes it difficult, what would you say, what makes it difficult to put them together as a team? I think w one of the reasons is uh, something specific about the Romanian culture, which uh, we, we have this power distance between a youngster and uh, a grown-up. They see them as, uh, as maybe more knowledgeable and they um, tend to be... Uh, so it's, it's, very, it's very easy for, for a student to be open to another student, but very hard to be open to a grown-up and to relate with him. Uh, and also the, the age difference and uh, you know the, the, their backgrounds and, and so on. Uh, I see that, that that's a b uh, barrier in, in their in their process in their educational process. Yeah, that's, that's actually an interesting uh, one. Power distance, perhaps just briefly, for uh, people who are listening and have, they haven't heard it before. It really describes the. Uh, maybe you can add to it if I'm not saying it completely correctly. But really describes um, you know a property of a hierarchical system. Uh, where somebody who is higher in the hierarchy is more right 
than the person who's lower in the hierarchy and it's kind of the opposite of a meritocracy. So, uh, I don't know, but do you have experiences with that? I mean, you, you grew up not in Romania really, no, right? I grew up in America yeah. um, until I was 21 years old. So, you know, how much experience can a 20 year old have mm -hmm. actually? But it did help with the accent. So go America, that, <laughs> uh, that helps. Um, and it did help with the culture which uh, I'm starting to realize there is such a thing as culture and you hear mm -hmm. it in all the business books and all the leadership programs that we attend. There's something about this culture or organizational culture and there is something in that and I, I am glad to think uh, that I did steal some of that with them. So there's a work ethic that's built into most Americans. You, you know, they work hard, the mm -hmm. dollar is earned and all that good stuff. So I came with that, which helps me in business. I'm very focused on what I want to do and I understand the value of my dollar. I've never had issues with diversity, but that's just because, so maybe because of the size of my companies, up to 20 or so people, um, there's not really that much place for diversity. I mean, I hire both women and, and men and I don't discriminate in any fashion there, but there is the social aspect that you mentioned. So will I be able to party with this person? Can I discuss with him the mm -hmm. way I would discuss with, you know, somebody that I'm going to entrust the decent portion of my success uh, with. So I, I think about these, but I've never been challenged on any of them. So I But did you see it perhaps the other way around? So for example, have you ever had an associate start fresh in the company, you being the boss of, uh, of the enterprise, uh, that, how do you say, that they were holding back uh, just because you were present? So that oh, yeah. they were, you know, having, having the hierarchy in mind and this kind of power distance that we were talking about earlier. Sure. So yeah, thanks for framing it that way. Mm -hmm. Of course, I've seen that happen and it still happens now, but also because we're in a technical business and, you know, we're always afraid of being proven wrong or showing that our line of thinking is wrong. And I'm completely different. I don't care for blame. I don't care who did it. Uh, I want to know who did it as a teaching opportunity to say, hey, Let's go in my office and let's talk about this and let's just throw some ideas around and see if we can find some other way around it. And not everybody feels like that. So I definitely seen that. I probably see it at almost all of our daily standups. Somebody's going to refrain for saying what they think just because I'm there, because I still participate in some of the mm -hmm. technical meetings. So yeah, I definitely see that. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good framing of that because I wouldn't have thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have anything to add? Any of your own experiences with that? Yeah, so I, I've learned what, what, what that means, uh, working, uh, working in Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, my manager there, was, uh, so th there was once uh, a problem and the problem was caused by me and it was a huge problem. And uh, the servers were down and I, I went to, to Tom, of course, we, uh, with my eyes uh, in, in the floor and said, Tom, uh, I screwed it up. So it's, it's, it's really nasty. So the servers are down. Uh, and the first, uh, the first question he asked me was, and uh, do you know how to solve it? And I said, yes. And how, how long it will take? About 30, 30 minutes or so. Oh, 30 minutes. Good job, Andre, good job. Yeah. So <laughs> I asked myself back then, so is it me? Is it my English? Maybe he didn't really understood how, how, <laughs> how, how that goes, you know? So I, I'm to blame and, and this is really uh, critical. And uh, I, I had the guts to, to ask him that uh, about uh, three or four months afterwards, you know, stand in a one-to-one. -one. But Tom, what was in your mind? So I was to blame, it was my fault. And you said, excellent job. And uh, he told me, but Andre, we, we work in, in the IT business. We, we have bugs, we, that, that's something normal. And uh, the bugs are because, yeah, we, we fail at some point. And, and that's good because that's, that's something totally normal and totally human. So, uh, and you came to me and you said you found a problem in, in the production system. And I, 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 I thought it was really bad. And, and you told me you will solve it in only 30 minutes. So great job, Andre. The system is better now because of you. Yeah. So that's a lesson I sure. will always uh, It's teach a completely to different well. perspective, right? Yes, yes. Uh, it was mind blowing for, yeah. for me. I mean, you both being in IT in a sense, uh, or de facto, I mean, we have this kind of thinking, you know, that, you know, um, you know, fail often, fail fast. 
try not to fail too hard though. It's always uh, the unspoken, <laughs> the exactly. unspoken edition. But uh, so the principle is is there in, in software for, for, for a long time. Um, so I'm still wondering when I was when I'm thinking about Romania in particular, who has this fairly high rated cultural marker of power distance. Um, what can we do to, how to say, move the society or the culture a little bit uh, you know, along towards more of a meritocracy? I'm wondering if actually the IT industry could be you know, taking a leading role for that. You know, you won't, you, I think you find much more power distance in, uh, in other industries than in IT here in the country. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I guess that's the case. So the question, the general question is really, how can this be inspiring this different perspective looking at things for other companies and other industries? I think, and this is just my thinking, is that just the way that uh, Andre explained it now, that's an eye opener to anyone that's experienced this. So, you know, if you're starting out and you're in one of these IT companies and you hear Andre's story, he's like, wait, that's completely different than what I'm getting. If I make a mistake, I have to hide under a desk because my boss will kill me or something. Or like find that. somebody else to blame. Right, right. <laughs> Or blame yeah. it on the provider, right? Mm -hmm. It's usually an upstream problem. Um, so I think that should be inspiring in and of itself. I've also always felt since I've come in 2001, so I've been here for 20 yeah. years now, um, I've always felt that Romania lacks management skills. So leave leadership aside. Leadership, you, you know, leaders are sometimes made. They're not, you know, they're formed, they're not always born. A hard situation can build a leader, at least that's how I felt. I was not supposed to be doing this, I was thrown into this mess. So if I was able to get to this point, I'm sure others will as well. So I think the idea is that um, sharing these stories is one, the fact that Romania doesn't have a management culture, we don't have that schooling, uh, that's what I've always I always complain about, you know, we don't have the right managers coming out of the schooling system, sales and all of that stuff. We just don't have the culture yet. Maybe now has changed. I don't know. But I think his example is good and we should all promote that on YouTube and push that around and let people know that there is at least a different mentality to the way you react to problems. And then secondly, I don't know, the schools need to do something, I think. And of course, our children will be better because of these experiences. So it might be slow but definitely my children will know these hard earned lessons. And I will try to teach other kids as well as I meet them and you know go out for beers and do what we do. So, but I think the schools would probably have the most impact if you ask me. There was something in the US that changed my life forever. We were poor in the US obviously because we came from Romania, but there was one thing that changed my life drastically. It was called Get a Life. So it was one season, which is one semester of school, and the purpose of that class was to teach you many things. So they taught me uh, how to use a hammer, how to do accounting, basic accounting, what it means to have a ledger and stuff like that for if I wanted to be a business owner. Uh, they taught me how to cook bread and all sorts of different things. That class literally formed my entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial thinking. It got me thinking that I don't need to be just one thing. And as a matter of fact, it need, I should be generalist so that I can adapt to, you know, whatever life's going to throw at me. So maybe these types of initiatives would be good. Maybe they are. I don't know, because I'm not really connected to social media and whatnot. But uh, yeah, I think that would help. So his story to wrap up my idea, that's a good one. It, I think that would help um, schools and then what we can do individually, teach yeah. our kids, teach our neighbors, kids. I, that's a, I mean, you have opened a really interesting subject. I was wondering, Andre, when you listen uh, to this, what would you say? Does, do the schools uh, contribute something or enough with regards to getting people ready to learn maybe even self-management skills? Yes, definitely. That was, uh, that was also my idea because I'm, uh, I'm very passionate about education. And I do that at different levels. So uh, I'm even involved in uh, um, in contributing with some with in groups which create public policies at, at the national level for education. So I know the educational system very very well, and uh, I think uh, we should approach this this problem as uh, very in, we should have an integrated approach. 
So we are, we alone as, as, as private companies, we, we cannot change this culture. Uh, the state alone cannot change this culture. So it's a lot about solidarity. But uh, one, of the key, uh, one of the key actors here is, uh, is the educational system because we are taught in the educational system to listen to, to the teacher and to do as, the, as he says or she says and uh, to learn everything by heart and uh, to, uh, to have uh, only good grades because that will make our life better, which is uh, not at all what, uh, what the life is about. So uh, we learn, uh, we, we learn in, in the first grades or actually the whole, in the whole educational system, we learn calculus. So everything is there. You have all the, the data there. You need to add up some numbers and one plus one makes two. It's like a chess game where you see everything and only your intelligence can, uh, can, can help you make the, be the best decision. But in life, you don't have all the variables. And in life, it's not all about calculus. So uh, our parents also told us that if you will go to high school and then you go to college and then you go to university and then you will have a job, you, you'll have a successful life. This is calculus. Mm -hmm. But in life, it's not about calculus. You don't have all the variables. When you go to, to, to shopping, you don't know if Carrefour is better than, than uh, uh, Lidl in, in that particular moment, you know? So you have a lot of unknown variables and statistics and probability is probably better to learn in, in, in school than, than calculus. Also, um, uh, the autonomy that Marius was talking about. So children and, and, and students I, I interview, they uh, are, are afraid to, or actually not afraid, they don't really know how to, uh, if they have an opinion and how to express it. And so That's it's sad. a lot deeper, yeah. you know, yeah. it's a lot deeper. So we, we talk about entrepreneurial uh, skills and so on, but they, they, they lack basic, basic skills like autonomy, like uh, critical thinking and so on. So yes, this process is a complex one and every one of us needs to be somehow involved to to make R Romania better because that's why I, I came back to Romania because I think that here I bring the most value and um, I'm trying to do that every day. Super. I love that. <laughs> I have to say, yeah, you know, let me just add, I, I also had uh, opportunity to uh, spend time with students here and um, talk with them and pick their mind a little bit and see how they think and how they feel. I have to say that I think all of them are, are very conscious about the fact that what they are, the curriculum that they're going through right now is just for them to get the papers, not going to be useful in itself. They know they're lacking some of those skills that in the end, perhaps for their career later on, will be essential. A lot of them have to do with, you know, soft skills and, you know, you know managing yourself, expressing yourself. Um, you know, a lot of these things are, are really missing. So a little bit back to you being um, people managers. So if you see, because I will assume you also work with, a, with some people that just came from the university and you observe that they are lacking these skills. What's the best way? What's, what's your way of encouraging them to develop these skills? Focus on them a little bit. Do you offer anything for them for, or is it just a personal mentoring? How do you do that? Oh boy. So I'm not, I don't feel I'm particularly good at this because if I was, I'd probably have a higher retention rate, but we're getting better. So every year we're, you know, we're holding on to more people for longer periods of time and they're always going to better and better paying, paying jobs and more technical responsibility. So I feel I'm doing something right, informing them, at mm -hmm. least from a technical point of view for the soft skill and all of that stuff. I don't do much. I mean, uh, honestly, we have our HR department, which helps me you know, intervene and helps us with some communication material and stuff like that. But it's very, I don't know how to say low end stuff. So just how to answer emails, how to pick up the phone and how to just basically, uh, because we're in support, that means I deal with people that are often uh, upset 
You know, nobody calls support department and say, hey guys, I just called to say, how are you? They call because they have a technical problem and they want some resolution. So that's the premise of what we're dealing with. We're dealing with people that are potentially upset because their systems are not working. And unfortunately, when people are upset, they're also not very kind. They lose themselves. So we teach our people the minimum of, look, treat them as they're upset walk as if you're walking on glass or eggshells and you'll, you'll be better off. Technically, however, we invest quite a bit because that's mm -hmm. our bread and butter. So technically I roll up my sleeves, I get, you know, I get my hands dirty and I get in there with them and I do trainings. Um, and I do that because I feel I have a better vision of, uh, or not vision. I have a wider experience in many of the technologies and services that, you know, I can help them compare. That's my store of style. I, I can I do a comparison type of training. And uh, of course, we also pay for training. We mm -hmm. did the LinkedIn learning for quite a bit, and then we found something more uh, more suitable for us. So we invest in these training platforms to keep our technical skills up there and our soft skills are, you know, uh, I made it sound like they're low end, but it's definitely mm -hmm. not low end. It's important information that if they haven't been exposed to it before, they will definitely know how to handle an upset customer or you know, it teaches them some sim uh, empathy, yeah. which is very important. Oh yeah. Very important. <laughs> and working with customers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so sure. that's what we do, but we would mm -hmm. love to, uh, of course, as we grow to do it better. We realize that uh, having happy employees is just as important, if not more important than having happy customers <laughs> because the employees keep those customers happy. So there's a shift going on in, in our collective minds within our company to sort of see how we can better our in, internal processes for keeping our yeah. uh, employees uh, happy. That just reminds me, it was, I think, Richard Branson uh, who said something along the lines of, you know, if you're uh, something like uh, our number one priority are not the customers, they have to be the uh, the employees, which was a bit of a you know strange thing to say back then when he said it. Sure, but it came came from this particular mindset also. So if I don't have the the employees being looked after and and uh, educated and treated well and so on, it's not going to happen for the customers either. So that's uh, you know why he right. started with this mindset. It took me. 20 I don't years. remember the exact words of the quote, but they were. No, I remember it. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's on LinkedIn. I follow yeah. him too, so and it's it's good. It took me about twenty years to come to that conclusion. Mm -hmm. I've always felt no, keep the customer first, and I'm curious how long it took him to get to that yeah. point. <laughs> but it, there's truth in it. Right, right. So you were just speaking about uh, that in practice, like like in the office, uh, you're trying to teach. Um, people some some basic skills about you know how they can open up how they lead how they learn empathy uh, all these kind of things uh, leading by example is, is I think is a big thing for you uh, I Andre in in your uh, CV on LinkedIn I saw something interesting I wanted to go there is I I've, I've learned on it at least that you've been also involved with uh, the Boy Scouts uh, organization and I was wondering if there so first of all, I, as far as I know, uh, also in the Boy Scouts, there's a code, so to speak, about um, you know leadership principles, because in, inherently it's a it's uh, there's a hierarchy somehow, but there are also uh, Boy Scout leaders. So uh, there there's a code, and I I looked through some of them, and I thought I found a lot of parallels uh, into what we also today would be saying in modern leadership education has, has value. A few things strike me a little bit odd, but maybe that's because it's, a, it's also structured as a hierarchical um, organization. But if you think uh, back to, to that time, is there anything that you say that, you, that comes to your mind where you say, you know, this is something that I've learned there about leadership that to this day uh, I uphold as a value for you know, my own leadership style? Yes, actually, actually the motto, my, my life motto is from there. So uh, making each day the, the world a better place is from there. That's one thing I've learned from there. The passion for education comes from there because I, I've been in, in some NGOs and most of them were in, in education. Uh, this is where my, price, my passion started. And um, from, from the leadership principles, uh, I was uh, I was even then a bit of a um, different, let's say, leader. 
uh, trying to, to bring new concepts into leadership and that was not always seen as good and uh, bringing always something new, trying new stuff. Uh, I, uh, everybody, everybody thought I'm experimenting with the children. But uh, actually, yes, I, I was trying to, to evolve and to understand what leadership is about. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that remain from, from there is give, give the people autonomy and responsibility and trust that they will do their jobs. And uh, even now, after, after, after so many years, I, I, I try very hard to give up the control to gain more motivation on, on their behalf and uh, um, to, to not always control them every hour, what they do and if they do something good, but uh, trying to, to bring them to, to that stage where they are really, uh, they have their project, they are some little entrepreneurs in my company, this is their project. They don't have the technical knowledge. If they are new, they don't really have the technical knowledge to, to, to solve that problem. But they have all the resources in the company which they can involve. But not the, the senior is the responsible of the project, but the junior is responsible to involve the senior and to know when to involve the senior and uh, uh, making them little intrapreneurs in, in my company I see that they 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 really thrive, and um, probably one of the, one of the best uh, one of the best feedbacks I, I I have from from this approach is is actually from from my my right hand as we as we say mm -hmm. in Romania. So uh, th there's there's a there's a girl who uh, who helps me in I, in every project, and um, I, I just raised the, her the salary because she deserves that. She didn't ask for that, but she deserves that. And the first thing she said was, Andre, don't worry, I'm here. I'm not leaving you. <laughs> so uh, that, that was... That's beautiful to hear. Yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. So yeah, yeah this, this approach, I think, uh, can, be, can be tried at least. I'm mm -hmm. not saying it's, it's the, uh, the perfect one, but give them autonomy and give up you, uh, you, yourself the, the control uh, is can only lead to, to to better stuff in the long term. Yeah, right. Because you know, people that are being told at a at a micro level what to do, usually they just disengage. So they they will do what you say, but there's no more creativity or innovation coming out of that because actually you put them in a you know mentally unsafe place. Because if your answer is the always the only right one, why bother? You know. Uh, going the extra mile. Why bother coming with new ideas? I think you unteach uh, this this ability with you know the uh, the opposite approach, so to speak. I have some situations where I don't agree with a particular decision, mm -hmm. but sometimes I just go with the flow and say, "Okay, you do that, and we see what happens." Mm -hmm. And uh, there were many times when I was wrong in the end. So. I also try to learn from them, You're right? And I also try. To, I always say that, okay, so you were right, I was wrong, and that empowers them. Right. I can clearly see that. How do you feel about that? Exactly as Andre explained it. <laughs> but I was thinking along the yeah. lines of this, and uh, I don't want to take this in a different parallel. But this giving up control, I agree. I do it all the time, and it hurts every time i don't you know <laughs> a lot i'm an it guy i need to be I, I like there the I, vulnerability that you both are displaying it hurts right now about this. it hurts because it's real it is real yeah. it is real and you're fighting yourself more than you are the team so i do it all the time and i have to step back mm -hmm. and i'm just fighting myself all the time maybe i should take a look in our ticketing system maybe i should take a look at the meeting uh -huh. minutes and i fight off that what happens in and I agree it works for the majority of the time it does work and it does lead to better people that are that feel more comfortable they they make their own decisions they fail they so it's a learning process and overall I think that yes that's right but sometimes there's spectacular failures and uh, those hurt mm -hmm. and what worries me is that those reinforce my initial instinct of no don't give up the control let it let it go uh, does that make sense? Yeah, of course it does. What I wanted to ask, however, is this 
a situation that only happens to us and I'm assuming that we're you know you're probably not running a Google sized company if you are congratulations mm -hmm. we're running you know small to medium sized businesses is this a problem that only us type of people have where we're somehow technical we're still involved in the day to day i mean i don't see the ceo of google or alphabet or whatever having these issues because i doubt he ever gets his hands dirty and goes down to his technical department and says all right guys we should do this yeah because it's physically impossible even if they're wired that way you know if, if you have i don't know more than a thousand employees you can, you can of course not control everybody however you can hire a management team who scales that level of control for you okay so uh, you can still do it directly <laughs> <laughs> okay but uh, you know i can tell you um, from you know personal experience that there are also uh, large uh, companies where there are you know islands sometimes even large islands uh, where degree of micromanagement is still uh, very present uh, because there just has to be, you know, one leader high enough that thinks this way, that doesn't really, really does not trust people and believes that people cannot be trusted. They need to be pushed and controlled uh, deep inside because they're really afraid of the, of you know, of losing of the of vulnerability that, that comes with it. Um, and then, of course, they hire people that are like them at the moment they need to scale themselves. Uh, and so there, there can be quite large islands of, you know, places in larger corporations where you don't want to be. Other parts of the corporation might be completely great uh, to work for, you know. Right. Yeah. So, um, I guess we're nearing the end of the show. So, uh, I wanted to ask you something a bit personal. You can take a minute to reflect on it. Um, it's about your own leadership brand. So, if you look back, I mean, imagine yourself 20 years from now. What's the kind of leader that you want people to say you have been for them? How would you want that people characterize you? <laughs> That's a tough question, Frank. I, I'm always asked, uh, what is that, that skill that an entrepreneur needs to have to be successful? And of course, there are plenty of skills. But uh, if it all comes down to one skill, I think uh, that the entrepreneur is the one who brings people together. You have the skill to bring the customers, to bring the employees and uh, to, to create an ecosystem of trust. So uh, I, I, I would like to, to be seen as, as a person who, who brings trust and brings people together. Well, that sounds beautiful. Good, well done. That was nice. Yeah. And I'll spin off of that. Yeah, and I swear off. I was thinking in the same direction, but <laughs> I'll use my own words, mm -hmm. which aren't as, as beautifully uh, as yours were. So I always think, and I've always been thinking as, as I'm going, that I would have liked to have better organizational skills just so I could obtain those types of things. So I need to be able to organize my people. I need to get them on board. I need to get them pumped up to do these things. So yeah, I would like people to think that I was a good organizer of things and people. <laughs> Super. <laughs> Good. So then um, uh, we thank you for, uh, for being here. It was a super interesting talk. I have a feeling we could have continued that for another hour or two without feeling uh, bored about the subject. Um, it was super nice. Thank you every everybody for watching. Thank you once again for Mindspace for allowing us to use your wonderful facilities for filming this episode. And everybody take care. Bye bye. <laughs>